Associate Professor Greg Cuny. Greg Cuny. Um, he will present a very timely and very important topic on the uh, banning of Islamic Defenders Front, FPI. And before we get started with the presentation, I would like to mention very briefly uh, Pat Greg's short bio. So Pat Greg is an Associate Professor of uh, Indonesian politics in the Department of Political, um, Political and Social Change, Squirrel Belt School of the Asia and Pacific Affairs, AMU. And as for his uh, research interests, Pat Greg's uh, research has covered lots of broad issues, including Indonesian politics, democratization, and Islamism, and also um, jihadist strategy and ideology. And as for his research, uh, highlights for his research career, um, one of them, he was just appointed as member of orders of, uh, of the Order of Australia. So if you are not familiar with this uh, kind of Australian <coughs> honor system appointments, the Order of Australia is uh, signifies the highest recognition for the recipient's um, contribution and outsta outstanding achievements and services for the country. So uh, congratulations again, Patrick. <laughs> we are very proud of him. And uh, he's also chair of the Australia and Indonesia Institute within the Department of Foreign Trades, uh, Foreign Affairs and Trade in Australia. Um, there's a very long list of his career highlights, of course, I couldn't mention here. Uh, please do check his academic page. And now moving along to our main session, please welcome Associate Professor Dr. Greg Kuhn. Thank you very much, Eva, for that really kind introduction. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, so, uh, I, I think the full title of the presentation, there's too many words to fit on the screen, was banning the Islamic Defenders Front, testing the limits of state control. Uh, so, uh, okay. So there's been surprisingly little media coverage in Australia and indeed the international press over what's happened to the Islamic Defenders Front FBI oh, since November, really. Um, and the title just mentions banning FBI, but in actual fact, it's a series, we're really discussing a series of government actions against FBI, the most momentous of which was the banning. But there's also been the fatal shooting of six FBI guards who were part of the FBI leaders, um, personal security detachment, that's the leader's name, Hubby Brizik, as many of you will know, as well as the arrest and prosecution of Hubby Brizik and a number of other senior FBI leaders. And indeed, just last night, uh, on cue for this presentation, they arrested the Secretary General of, or the former Secretary General of FBI, um, Munarman and um, the police also claimed to have found explosives at the FBI headquarters. So this is an indication of the rolling nature of these anti-FBI events. So I say I'm surprised there's not been more media coverage because these strike me as a significant series of events for at least three reasons. The first is that they represent what I think is the most concerted state crackdown are against Islamist social organisations in many decades. Potentially, one could look back to the banning of uh, PII, PE, in 1985, I think it was, when they refused to accept Panchasila as the sole basis, as the Asastan Gaon. But I think an even better parallel would be to go back to 1960 with the banning of Mashumi. That was an organisation of equivalent size and breadth across. Indonesia. So this is quite an historic turn of events. Um, and that organisation was banned by Sukarno. The second reason why this is significant is that it's opened up a fierce debate about the wisdom and fairness of such actions. 
Uh, it has added to the polarisation that has already existed in, within the community. And this is a polarisation that FBI itself has played no small role in fomenting over many years. Um, and this is a situation where many progressive groups, many liberal-minded NGOs that normally um, come out very strongly on matters of rights, have actually applauded this ban. Islamists on the other side of the divide, of course, have condemned it, but often in a muted fashion, and that's often because people fear recrimination from the government that they themselves may be targeted if they're too outspoken in their opposition to uh, the ban. And then there's foreign Indonesianists, such as myself and many others, who debate the significance of this and what it means for Indonesian democracy. In my own view, this is indubitably a further major reversal for Indonesian democracy because it looks to have a weak basis in law and also in terms of security grounds and to be driven by political considerations above all else. The third point which is significant about this is the considerable risk that these actions will be counterproductive, that these actions will actually worsen the threat from militant Islam rather than reduce it. They will have exactly the opposite consequence to what they, the government says they will have and what many NGOs believe that they will have. Um, let me also add, trying to preempt the inevitable social media response to this, um, that uh, I don't admire FBE, I'm not a Penchinda or Pengagum FBE. <laughs> Uh, in fact, I think they're a thuggish, intolerant, sectarian outfit with a shameful record of intimidating and abusing people over decades in Indonesia. But they should, and they do, have rights. The same rights as anyone else in the democracy. And my argument is that their rights are being traduced and that this should be a concern for anyone who is who has... Um, who cares about freedom within Indonesia. Is this the right way to proceed against such a disruptive organisation as FBI? I think that is the key question, and I want to fundamentally um, dispute that banning and all the surrounding measures um, are the way, the best way to handle this. So let me go to the content side. So just. Briefly, there's quite a lot, I'm sorry, there's quite a bit of detail in some of this, but the detail, it seems to me, is necessary in order to make the case of whether the government has strong grounds or not for pursuing FBI. So a bit of historical context, and then I really want to focus on these three key events, although really there are many dozens of events one could look at. The arrest and prosecution of the FBI um, and Imam Basar, uh, uh, Habib Rizik, Shihab, the fatal shooting of the six guards by the police and the actual banning of FPI. So they're really the main part of it and I want to critically examine all of those. And then last of all I want to look at the consequences of the banning both for Islamist movements and for Indonesian democracy. So FBI's origins, we know this will be known to many of you, really go back to 1980, 1998 when the military formed a kind of militia group called Panswakasa, and they did that to support um, the then um, presidency of Habibi, which was under siege from students wanting more radical reforms. It became uh, FBI shortly afterwards, and within a few years it really developed into a very large national organisation, not necessarily a particularly well run one for most of its life, and it became notorious for being involved in vigilante attacks um, on all sorts of groups on, for supposed places of immorality, um, brothels, um, uh, uh, sly bars, gambling dens, that kind of thing as well as sweeping, sweeping against foreigners, sweeping against people of minority faiths, all sorts of things like that. It claims to have six to seven million members but and branches in all provinces. Very hard to confirm uh, those kind of figures, but it is big, and this is what marks it out from most other banning. It's far bigger than Hizbutakria, which was banned three years ago. Um, 
Uh, so, important to note here, and very important part of the equation as to why FBI was banned, was that um, that organisation and Hubby Brzezik were really central to the mobilisation of people, the massive mobilisation of people against AHOC in late 2016 and 2017 um, for the gubern Jakarta gubernatorial elections. Um, Shortly after those elections, police began investigating Rizik for various matters relating to um, uh, dis dissemination of pornography and breach of the um, electronic uh, dissemination laws, whatever they call ITE. Um, and so he left initially to Malaysia because uh, he's doing a PhD there. He's just got his PhD um, a week or so ago. Uh, and then moved on to Mecca, where he spent more than three years effectively in exile. Um, so I mentioned before Hizbut Tahrir, just as there's a splicing of different events here, but they're all part of the story. Hizbut Tahrir, while he was away, or a few months after he left, Hizbut Tahrir was banned in 2017. Uh, then, of course, Rizik returned in late last year uh, after this period of absence. So here's a detailed timeline. Rizik returns to Jakarta on the 10th of November. On the 14th of November, his daughter has, has had a, her delayed wedding, wedding ceremony and also the celebrations for the birthday of the Prophet Muhammad, no, Malin Nadi celebrations in, in, in um, Rizik's home area of Petamburan. Uh, on the 7th of December, there is this um, shootout in effect between his guards, six of his guards, and two police surveillance cars, um, which led, left those guards uh, killed uh, dead. Um, on the 10th of December, Rizik uh, hands himself in to police and then he's charged with various offences. 30th of December, FBI is banned by the government. 15th of March, Rizik's court case commenced. And just last night, uh, the Secretary General, the former Secretary General of FBI, because legally it no longer exists, was arrested and the Counterterrorism Police, Dental Society 88, announced that they'd found explosive material at the FBI headquarters. So you can see uh, this is a developing story. Uh, so I'll come and look at uh, most of these things. So let's look at the return. So as I said, he came back to Jakarta on the 10th of November. Um, I won't go into all that. There's a, quite an involved story about why he was so long abroad and how he got to come back. We haven't got time to uh, go into that today. But the authorities knew that there would be quite a crowd for him. I think the police estimate and the BIN estimate was about 10,000 people might turn up. In actual fact, um, uh, well over 50,000 people turned up completely blocking the airport, bringing the airport to a standstill, blocking all the roads into and out of the airport. The airport itself was effectively paralysed for five hours. I think it took Abhi Brizik about four or five hours to get from the airport to his, his home in central Jakarta. A few of us have had trips from the airport that are almost as long as that. Um, so it was utter chaos. And, and this was a complete failure to predict the magnitude of the welcome for, for Rizik by the police and by intelligence agencies, not for the first time. Um, on the 10th of, oh, there he is going triumphantly back into his uh, home village in Petamburan. And uh, no sooner he arrived than he began receiving visits from a, a wide range of dignitaries, in this case, Amis Baswedan in the black, um, meeting Rizik along with his uh, deputy governor, both of whom later contracted COVID. I don't know if it's from these meetings or not. Um, and, uh, and the entire board of the PKS party, the Prosperous Justice Party, met Rizik on the morning of the 11th. So, um, and this is the Malinabi event uh, in Petamburan on the uh, 14th of um, November. And you can see there some people have masks on, but people are packed in tightly together. This is not a spacious area, Petamburan. And so people were really jammed in there. And uh, the figure has been mentioned in the media. I don't know how well it stand up to scrutiny that at least 80 people contracted COVID after these events. So that's one of the claims made. Um, there was a... Uh, 
So there was a cabinet meeting on the 16th of November, a few couple of days after this, at which Jokowi was reportedly furious that this event had taken place and that the police and Jakarta authorities had not done a whole lot more to stop it. A few hours after the cabinet meeting, the police chiefs of Jakarta and West Java were sacked for not preventing this from happening. So that was a very direct signal. Um, I imagine the National Police Chief might have also been a bit worried because he also took quite an accommodating role um, to this event on the 14th of November. So he survived and two of his colleagues didn't. Um, at the end of that month of, the, of November, 28th of November, Rizik checked into the UMI hospital, Rumasaki UMI in Bogor, claiming he had exhaustion. So there was a SACAS team, sorry, a SACAS COVID team, a COVID kind of task force team, who went to the hotel and demanded to know what his medical condition was. And the director of the hospital, medical director of the hospital, lied to them, um, saying that he'd been tested negative for COVID, where in actual fact, it was, we now know, he was positive. So there's a lot of inquiries about um, what his health was. Uh, I think uh, two days later, he, he and his entourage, his large entourage, slipped out the back of the hotel, still presumably positive to COVID, and went to stay at a family member's house uh, not far away. Um, so, uh, and on the 2nd of December, Rizik uh, apologised to crowds and uh, apologised for, for have holding events where there were large crowds and agreed to pay the 50 million rupee fine that had been um, levied upon him by the Jakarta government for that. So, um, some of these things we'll come back when we're talking about the prosecution to him. So, uh, now I want to move on to his arrest. And this is not strictly chronological. I want to discuss the topics within themselves. Uh, so there's a little bit of splicing, as I mentioned before. So in early December, the police issued a summons for Rizik, uh, which he refused to respond to for a week. On the morning of the 7th, he was supposed to, he declared his intention to appear at the Jakarta Police Headquarters for questioning. But of course, a few hours beforehand, the shooting had taken place of the guard. So I'll deal with that shooting separately. Um, he said he'd refused to go into the um, uh, questioning because uh, he needed to rest and recover. But nonetheless, on the 7th, he did go in, answered questions, was interrogated, answered questions, and was arrested, put into detention in the um, Boulder Metro Jaya cells, and um, charged on two counts. Uh, there he's being examined in the, um, in the cells. And the two counts are inciting the public to criminal action. I mean, this is elaborating what's in the charges. For disregarding public health protocols and social distancing and avoiding mass gatherings. The Patamburan one that I mentioned, but also another one in Megamendum, where FBI has a, a kind of a complex there of teaching and um, uh, sort of outreach that by complex the day before. And also defying a request or command of COVID task force authorities by concealing evidence of his true med medical condition. So these were the two main cases that were against him. Another five FBI executive members were also charged with breaching health quarantine laws. So those cases are all proceeding in parallel at the moment in court. So the court case began on the 15th of March, and um, this is uh, Rizik in the court. This is exactly where he wanted to be. The initial plan was to hold that he would be online in the police, uh, in the Jakarta Police Headquarters. Um, he refused that arrangement. He and his lawyers walked out of the, uh, of the, from the session, the online session, and eventually the judges relented and allowed him to appear in person. Uh, he, looks, he looks quite calm there, but in actual fact, he's been typically disputatious uh, throughout the, the court sessions been clashing fiercely with the prosecutors on all manner of manners, and has been um, very trenchantly interrogating some of the witnesses. And, and I think, in fact, he would be happy with how his interrogations, his cross-examination has been going, because to my mind, he's been able to establish that FBI is being, and he are being treated quite differently from the way in which all sorts of members of the 
political elite or other organisations being treated, including the President himself, who attended events which broke the social distancing laws, broke the anti-crowd laws. So um, um, my view is that the court case is going well for him, which won't necessarily mean that he's found not guilty. But nonetheless, he is making the most of this situation. Um, and this brings me to the shootings. So uh, I mentioned that um, Rizik, uh, so he was returning from Bogor uh, late on the evening of the 6th of December. Um, and there was a convoy going along the Karawan Toll Road. Um, I think there were four vehicles as part of his immediate family and retinue. And then there are another, at least another two vehicles of guards. I should say some of the details about what happened are not clear. We have quite contrasting versions from the police and FBI. Both of those versions we now know had significant errors in them. Uh, so we can't rely either of those of, um, versions and we're waiting for a lot more detail to be released by, by the police. And indeed there's a Comnasum report which has also not been publicly released. Um, so uh, apart from what was said at a press conference. So, so some of the things that happened need to be confirmed. But nonetheless, as we understand it, two vehicles of uh, FBI guards and they were being followed by two police surveillance vehicles, um, unmarked police surveillance vehicles. So around about 11.15 that night, the two surveillance vehicles tried to get in between Hubby Rizik's car and the rest of the convoy uh, because the police were under instructions not to allow Rizik to escape. They clearly wanted to take him in for questioning. There was this threat that if he didn't turn up for interrogation, that he would he would be he would be forced to, to go in. So they were under instructions not to let him escape. And the guards then engaged in basically this sort of grand theft auto <laughs> series of crashes and clashes and um, name calling and then eventually shooting and throwing of objects and lashing out with sharp weapons and the like. This went on for um, the best part of an hour. Uh, not only the toll road, but also Rizik's car uh, left the off ramp going into Karawang. It took place within Karawang as well. And then the police surveillance vehicles and the guards headed back onto the toll road. So Rizik was able to give the slip to the police surveillance vehicles in Karawang, which you imagine would have infuriated them. Rizik's guards seem to also be under clear instructions not to let the police stop Rizik's car. And so this is why we had this high stakes battle going on on the roads between the police and his guards. Um, at about 1am, shots were exchanged between the guards and the police. Um, one of the cars was forced out of this um, race, but then the police pursued the, one of the other cars. Both cars had six guards in them, by the way. Um, amongst other things, the guards were shouting at the police, calling them monkeys, kirudum. Um, in Arabic, uh, so just adding to the flavour of the moment. So eventually the, the police were able to force one of the guards' cars onto a roadside stop in the 40, 50 kilometre mark on the toll road. When they did that, it was clear that two of the guards inside were already dead, presumably shot by the police during the, um, this um, uh, kind of mutual road rage incident happening um, previously. But the remaining four guards were alive. So they were put into one of the police surveillance, or one of the, into a police vehicle, I should say. But the police said they didn't have any handcuffs or restraints. And so they were in the back, and there was one police officer in there with them, and another couple driving in the front. Shortly afterwards, they claimed the four guards tried to wrest the gun from the police officer, requiring the police to shoot them all dead. So I think there's something like 18 bullets shot, all from the same angle, all the people, all the guards were shot dead through the chest. So, um, uh, the, it's not as clear exactly where they were shot dead. The police initially denied responsibility for that, knowledge of that. But eventually, by 3 a.m. in the morning, they were all delivered to the police mortuary in central Jakarta. And of course, by that stage, all dead on arrival. Um, 
So the police said they had to kill the guards to protect themselves. So let me show you. So there's the police vehicle, um, the bullet hole and other smash marks where they claim that swords and things like that have been used. You see all the front of it's all beaten up. Um, there's the faces of the six guards. Very quickly, and the police press conference the next day where they put on display some of the weapons they'd found. And the most important thing, of course, are these two handguns. Um, uh, and it's reasonably well established. Komnas Hum confirmed that the guards had handguns. FBI denied it, but Komnas Hum seemed reasonably satisfied that there were pistols in the hands of the guards. Um, and you'll see the samurai sword and various kind of chalurit and you know, sickles and things like that there. Um, FBI called this a case of extrajudicial killings. The Human Rights, National Human Rights Commission, the Commonwealth Home Report, found a prima facie case for what they called unlawful killing. And they delivered what I thought rather damning finding that the killings would never have happened if the police had properly restrained the guards. Why would the police not have done that? There were dozens of police at the roadside. <coughs> So uh, this was a failure of proper police procedure. So the fact that these two guards had guns like this uh, is significant because FBI, to my knowledge, has never previously had lethal weapons. Usually they're armed with bamboo sticks, lumps of wood, battens, rocks, things like that. That's the way the sorts of things that deliver bruises and cuts but don't kill people usually. So to see them with samurai swords and particularly with firearms was um, something that we had not seen previously in FBI's history. It was extraordinarily brazen on their behalf because they must have known that the police would have had under surveillance Happy Rizzi and they must have known what the consequences would be for repeatedly ramming a police car for firing in the police car, for trying to hit the police with sharp weapons. Um, so there's a question about when did this decision to escalate this into basically a shootout, when was that made? Who knew about it within FBI? Did Rizik know that his guards were armed? Um, did the head of security, did the board of FBI know? None of those things are clear at the moment. Um, but nonetheless, you can see why the police must have been white hot with rage by the time they got that FBI car into that roadside stop on the toll road. Here they've failed, Rizik has escaped, these guards have been not only defiant but are using lethal methods to, to deter the police and so um, uh, it wouldn't be the first time in the history of the Indonesian police that um, people have paid with their lives for that kind of brazen resistance to um, police um, commands. One other interesting thing about this is that the, um, the, the media reported that there was a black Land Cruiser, new Toyota Land Cruiser, at the roadside stop at the 50 kilometre mark on the Karawan toll road. And that the person who got out of that Toyota Land Cruiser was giving orders to the police, including quite senior police there. Who that person was is not known. The, the Komnas um, Ham, as far as I know, did not make any reference to this, but there's been multiple eyewitnesses who talked about this. The speculation on social media is that this might have been the involvement of a very senior intel official but it's just speculation, we don't know. It's one of the questions about this and how high up in government did this kind of action, uh, that there might be knowledge of this kind of action went. Um, so the final thing to say is that the police have now, after the Commonwealth Sun report was released and under considerable pressure from politicians and from a human rights organisation, they determined there were three police officers who had a prima facie case of guilt in this case. 
They accepted there'd been unlawful killing. One of those police officers died in a single car accident in Tangerang a few weeks ago. Uh, he was just identified a couple of days ago. The other two officers are due to be charged sometime soon. So interesting thing is how this has been treated in the media. So this is JAS, this was the organisation that was formed by Bashir's son when they split from him when he pledged loyalty to ISIS a bit. Convoluted, but nonetheless, this is typical, and I think very much Jordan Newton for sharing some of these images for me from social media. They really give a flavour of the kind of discourse that's going on behind the scenes. So these are jihadists of the, the guards of the Ulama. So these people are being valorised for their role um, in the um, in protecting uh, Habib Rizik and paying with their lives for it. Uh, here's another one that came out very quickly. This is scenario apartheid, so the, the um, law enforcement officials uh, scenario. And that is the shooting. You see there's the six guards with Hubby Rizik behind them. And they're saying the case, the shooting of the Lascar is intended as a diversionary tactic and something that will arouse the anger and divert the attention of the Ummah. But be smart, concentrate on why these people were killed and who has done this. And so there's a lot of this kind of imagery on social media surrounding um, the, the killings. Um, so this brings me to um, the next bit, which is about banning of FBI. So this was announced by the Coordinating Security Minister, um, uh, Politics and War Minister, Mahfoud, on the 30th of December, signed by six officials. The, um, well, I don't need to go through six officials, but four reasons were given for banning FBI. So there's their headquarters. Within hours, their headquarters began to have its signs taken down and doors sealed and the like. So the four main reasons given. The first is that FBI's constitution violates the principles of the 1945 constitution of Panchasila and of the unitary state of Indonesia in Karadiri. And therefore, it's in breach of this regulation in lieu of the law, the Purpur Ormasa 2017, which is designed to protect the integrity of the constitution and Panchasila, the state ideology. Um, ministers later said that um, the most problematic elements of FBI's constitution were the mention of, uh, of caliphate, of Khilafah Islamia, the also mention of the use of the word hispa, and also inkari e basharia, so the unitary, sta uh, uh, unitary state of Indonesia based on sharia, I suppose would be an easy translation of that. So an Islamized Islamic unitary, uh, Indonesian unitary state. Um, this, and I'll come back and I'll go through each of these uh, individually. Second point was that FBI had failed to ex get an extension to its registration with the Ministry of Justice and Human Rights. And therefore, its status had expired on the 20th of June nine, uh, 2019. And therefore, it had been disbanded, according to the law, on the 21st of June. 2019, so 18 months before the ban was announced. The third point was that, uh, and this is in a way the most serious for FBI because it relates to terrorism, and it said that there had been 35 FBI executives, members and ex-members who had been involved uh, either directly or indirectly in acts of terrorism. Uh, 29 of those had been convicted, it said. Uh, it also mentioned that there'd been another 206 FBI members who'd been charged with various breaches of the peace, various criminal activities, and 100 of those had been convicted. Um, last of all, it said that FBI had consistently disturbed um, uh, social order by undertaking raids and sweepings and things like uh, that, and I talked about that before. So a wide range of measures followed this ban. All FBI bank accounts were closed. So this is in contrast to Hispo Takria. There was not that much follow-up to the ban of Hispo Takria three years beforehand. But in this case, it was sweeping 
no pun intended, uh, there were quite wide ranging activities. So bank accounts were closed, all the media accounts were closed, the police also directed that the media should not be repeating material that they have found in any FBI related websites or from FBI leaders, so really very attempt to tightly control um, the agenda. Uh, or the, the public discussion. There was also a legal challenge to FBI's ownership of its complex near Bogor, um, that that had been improperly obtained from a state-owned enterprise. So that case is ongoing. And there'd been investigation into FBI leaders and their assets. So quite a wide range of activity. So we need to examine each of these things carefully to see what justification we can find for this. So. We go, and I want to bring together the two elements of the terrorism and the violating constitution because they're both linked. So the first is this mention in the constitution of the caliphate, this Khilafah Islamia. Um, that had been in FBI's constitution for a great many years. I can't establish exactly when it was in there, but certainly in there in books that were published in the mid-2000s. Um, so why at this particular time was the government suddenly query this. Also have to point out a great many organisations have the word caliphate mentioned in their platforms or somewhere in their constitutions. It's not an unusual thing, an unheard of thing in Indonesia. Um, clearly one of the reasons for this is the government suspected that FBI was showing um, support for the uh, Islamic State, ISIS. Um, and so therefore the reference to Khilafia carried connotations that FBI wanted a transnational state, not a unitary Indonesian state. Gave us walled into a transnational state, not Indonesian state. Um, there was almost no evidence of that. FBI has been quite consistent in rejecting FBI, uh, rejecting ISIS, sorry, uh, and also in declaring its support for the 1945 constitution and for Panchasila. You could argue how sincere that is, but nonetheless on the public record consistently, that has been the organisation's view. Um, so it's hard to see why in this particular case, this would be strong grounds for banning FBI because of the mention of uh, Hilafa and those other terms, uh, Hispa and um, Bashari. I'm happy to talk more about this later, but I'll run out of time if I go into too much detail now. So this brings us to the terrorism issue. Um, whether FBI leaders endorsed and promoted ISIS and whether FBI leaders were involved in terrorism. So in Muffet announced the ban, he released five videos, uh, all of which are taken as evidence of FBI's pro-ISIS stance. There was a, one of these was a speech uh, that Rizik gave in Jakarta in 2014, and it has the following quote in there. What is good in ISIS we acknowledge is good. Their noble aspiration to uphold Sharia is a good thing. Their noble aspiration to uphold the Islamic Caliphate is a good thing. Their aspiration to oppose the tyranny of America and its allies is a good aspiration. If a government is tyrannical with its evil soldier, with evil soldiers, evil police, arresting and shooting, the people's possession seized, their land taken, Islamic law marginalised. Friends, I want to ask in general, tomorrow is there a need for ISIS or not? Uh, so this was taken as evidence that he was at the very least a fellow traveller with ISIS. FPE later claimed that in fact Rizik was mainly talking about the Palestinians and the Israelis here, the Palestinian cause, but that's not a particularly persuasive argument for me either. It seemed to me he was clearly expressing sympathy for ISIS, but in the context of what he saw as brutal persecution of Muslims in various parts of the Middle East. Again, by itself, it doesn't seem to me to be a compelling piece of evidence. There was also uh, evidence about the mass pledging of loyalty to ISIS held at various FBI events. And this is true. We, this is all on the public record. It was reported in newspapers. We know that this happened. The biggest one of these took place in Qasar, I think in January 2015. Um, it was a large FBI event to which they had invited a well-known um, uh, militant jihadist called Ustad Basri. 
whether the FBI people knew in advance or not, but that's where he asked everyone to take the pledge in support of ISIS. So lots of people raised their hand, uh, probably not thinking very much of it, just joining in, including some of those people who raised their hands was the Secretary General of FBI, Monama, who was arrested last night. And this was one of the pieces of evidence that was cited against him by raising his hand, it meant he was in effect, uh, had gone over to the ISIS side. I don't think it meant that at all. And for the many hundreds of people who were there, the overwhelming majority of them probably never thought they would do anything to do with ISIS at all. It just seemed to be taken by the moment and a particularly charismatic preacher in the form of Ustad Basri. It wasn't wise, but is it an event that you could use to um, ban an organisation that has millions of members? Um, So we need to see that kind of event in context. Um, we'd also need to note the FBY not only did take a strong stance against ISIS, it took a strong stance against terrorism, and that it had regularly sacked members who were seen as too extreme, who advocated use of violence or who spoke out in favour of terrorist attacks. It had quite a good track record in that, and quite often people who had those kind of militant views left of their own accord because they thought FBI was too moderate in its methods. So um, again, if we look at that broader track record, it's hard to make a case of FBI being strong in terrorists. And then we come to the last issue here, which is the fact that the so-called 35, in some other accounts it's 37, FBI members or former members involved in terrorist acts. Well, Sydney Jones typically has done wonderful research on this. She's looked through the list of 37 people and she's found that hardly any of them were active FBI members at the time that they were arrested for terrorism. Most of the people had long left FBI before they were involved in terrorism or arrested for terrorism charges, and quite a few of them had been sacked, had been dismissed from FBI because of their views. So it doesn't hold up. If you were going to use that criteria for banning FBI, well, then there'd be a whole lot of other organisations you'd be banning. We could start with Pamuna Mohamedia, for example, has had a lot of ex-members who have become involved in terrorist groups. PKS, Prosperous Justice Party, also. What is Islamia, there's lots of large Islamic organisations regarded as not security threats, part of the mainstream even, who have a tiny percent of their members who are drawn into terrorist attacks. So why is this a banning offence for FBI and not for those other organisations? There is a double standard here that the government does not address. Um, also point out that the Indonesian police themselves have used in the past Habib Rizik and FBI in counter-terrorism operations. They took Rizik to Poso in central um, Sulawesi to try and persuade jihadists there, J.I. and other people, not to engage in attacks on civilians, so that was an un-Islamic thing to do. It wasn't particularly successful, but they tried to use him. And during the FBI, during the SBY period, the then police chief, Dimo Pratopo, said, the police like to work together with FBI, particularly around Ramadan, to maintain order and prevent people from offending the Islamic community. So there's plenty of instances where security officials were working with FBI, not regarding it as some kind of um, seditious or extremely violent um, organisation. Um, the last point is, or the third point, is about the lapse registration. So, you know, I'm running out of time. So, very briefly, there is divided opinion on this. The government, which of course is not short of legal expertise, indeed the Deputy Minister of Justice and Human Rights is a professor of law from Gajamata, so he knows his stuff. And he was one of the people who drafted the ban, uh, the, the, the SKB entry that banned F, uh, FPE. They say that the law is um, watertight on this. Once FBI's registration lapsed with the Ministry of Justice and Human Rights, and it failed to get the extension, so that's the 20th of June, 2019, then it was, in effect, um, dissolved. 
and that the banning only formalised what had been in reality the case a year and a half before. Um, on the other hand, there are plenty of eminent legal authorities who say that in actual fact the law does not require an almost a social organisation to be registered. The only reason you have to be registered is if you want to receive government funds. And FBI, to my knowledge, has never received government funding. It doesn't have schools or anything like that that it might have got um, you know, government funding for. So they believe there is no strong legal case for banning FBI on the grounds that they did not have current registration. I'm not a lawyer, I'm not in a position to adjudicate on this, but it would be very interesting if someone like Kim Lindsay or Simon Butt was to look at the merits of both sides of the argument. Interestingly though, all lawyers I spoke to on this matter have said, we agree with the legal advice to FBI, it's a waste of time to take this to the court because the judges will always find in favour of the government on this. Which is not to say the FBI case is weak, but rather it would be, it would be a hostile judiciary that they might face. Um, so it's not an open and shut case, as one might think. Um, I think uh, Okay, so the fourth case was the one just about sweepings. I think I've dealt with most of that. Um, so, to conclude on this, most of the government's arguments about banning FBI are weak, at the very least, very disputable. They're not in any way a compelling case of banning an organisation so large as this. And it's not hard, in fact, to conclude that FBI has been singled out for political reasons. That's one of the things that, uh, that um, Abhi Rizik is concentrating on in the court case. So, um, let me discuss this a little bit further. So if we contrast this with HDI's ban in 2017, there was a genuine ideological element to this. Groups like Enu, moderate groups, said that this is an, this Hizbut Tahrir brings an alien ideology to Indonesia, something that threatens the existence of Indonesia's um, unitary state and Panchasila and its tradition of tolerance. And so Enu was really I think the main driving force behind the government deciding in the end to ban his Tahrir. So, and that was supported by a great many organisations. But it's different with FBI, because most FBI members have the same, exactly the same uh, religious rituals, religious understanding as any people do. They are Aswaja, Athul Sunawajima, and that is the practices followed according to surveys by at least 60% of Indonesian Muslims. So FBI are not different in terms of devotions and not necessarily particularly different in terms of base ideology. They might want Sharia, a stronger Sharia element in the national constitution, but apart from that, they're much more mainstream than his Tahrir was. Um, when they propose this Enkari Ibu Sharia, this Sharia based unitary state, that in fact has a long historical precedence within Indonesia. That's been one of the foundation debates in Indonesia since before 1945. Uh, and the argument now is that this should no longer be a debate which is allowed to occur. I haven't got time to go into that, but, um, but you could argue that why shouldn't this be a matter of ongoing debate? If you're an Islamist and you want to see Sharia Rafael, why shouldn't that be a matter of ongoing debate? Um, so Tempo Magazine has, not unusually, uh, done the best reporting on this, and they attribute the impetus to ban FBI directly to Jokowi. They say when this cabinet meeting took place on the 16th of November, two days after the mass gathering in, in Rizik's um, uh, kampung in Petamburan, uh, Jokowi was really angry, and this is the point at which decisions were made that action must be taken and that 
the ministers would look into the prospect of banning FBI. Apparently he also did this because there had been strong representations from the business community to him, that this was sending bad signals, you know, of foreign investors and the like would see the airport crippled for hours on end, this firebrand preacher commanding the streets, and the government had to do something about this. To my mind, perhaps even more compelling for Jokowi might have been the fact that this camp, very steady campaign that he and his government have been running for more than two years to roll back Islamism in the public service and in the political realm, that was threatened by Rizik's return. Because no sooner had Rizik landed in Jakarta and he started talking about a moral revolution and he met with the PKS leadership and he said, we're studying ways in which we can mobilise the public to reject the omnibus law, this Undangundam Chipta Koja, which was the centrepiece of Jokowi's second term, really, a legislative program. So the prospect that Rizik would try to get large numbers of people on the streets must have created a great deal of unease, not only for Jokowi, but a lot of other um, forces within the ruling coalition. They also had survey data that showed only about 30% of the population had positive thoughts towards Rizik. So they probably felt this was something that they could get away with. Um, so what are the consequences of banning? And this is my last sort of few slides now. The government feels as if the banning has gone very well indeed. Not much resistance pushed back from most of the Islamic community and indeed a lot of Muslim groups quietly approving of the decision. Um, one of the reasons for this is that those groups, although they're a bit worried about the details of it, they think it's not a wise thing to voice outward um, opposition to it at this stage. Um, what else have I got in there? It's also true that not many groups like Rizik. He's a very outspoken man. He often criticises other Muslim organisations and Muslim leaders. So there's a lot of senior ulama who find him a distasteful figure. And FBI is a group that's not also particularly liked in a lot of mainstream organisations. Not necessarily they want them banned, but they're not going to die in a ditch to defend it. Um, uh, and the other thing that this has done is it's showing the government is pushing new boundaries in how far it can go in its campaign against Islamism. And so the banning of Hizbul Takriya was one boundary, the arrest of Rizik was another, but the banning of an organisation of this size was show a much more bold and ambitious intent on the government's behalf. And it comes back to this notion that the second Jokowi term is a term in which they have to really marginalise political Islam. But now they have this alignment of conditions and that this provides the most propitious opportunity to do so. And I think you can tell from a lot of Islamist organisations how they responded that they believe this is a highly unfavourable circumstances for them. Having said that, there is a great risk of radicalism. We've seen this already. Um, Within the FBI community, um, there, is, uh, there is conviction that the state is deeply hostile to Islam and will use any measures at its disposal to hit back against it. The trial of Rizik, the banning of FBI, the shooting of the guards, all these things come into a meta-narrative of state hostility to murderous hostility towards um, Islam. Not unlike the kind of situation we had with the Tunjung Priok riots and the deaths of at least 100 people there, we don't know an exact figure, or even the shootings of, what was it, 11 or 12 people after the 2019 presidential elections. Probably by police, the case has never been properly answered, but certainly no one has been held to account for those shootings. And so in the minds of many Islamists, they see a pattern emerging here and a strengthening pattern on the part of the Jokowi government. Um, and you see this emergence from November, particularly uh, after shooting the guards, of a much more extreme and vengeful tone in social media um, for FBI. 
And we had the cases of FBI members planning bombings and other attacks as a way of retaliation. So this is one again, with thanks to Jordan uh, Newton for sending me this. Ayo Jihad, this was one of the things that came out. Um, that uh, the war has already begun, that the, the enemies are already attacking uh, Hib uh, um, Hubby Rizik and his family. Uh, you know, they're shooting, uh, you know, they've killed the seven um, uh, guards, uh, Rizik's guards. So prepare yourself and prepare your arms to become uh, a jihadist, a fighter. So you can see the tone here. Much more concrete is the so-called Chondet cell of FBI. So this man here is Hussein Hasni, and uh, here he is at, at um, Bashir's funeral, uh, sorry, funeral, at his court case. Uh, this group had previously, as far as I know, had known, no previous encounters with the police. After the shooting of the guards, they resolved that they would engage in bombings by way of hitting back. And so uh, the police raided Hossein's house and they found five bombs there, which using this TATP uh, material. And uh, the videos of their statements to the police were released on the media. It's easy for you to find them. Uh, Hussein and another guy, uh, Zulaimi, he talks in detail. This, was this event, the shooting of the guards that convinced us that we had to act. Initially, I thought we'd use Molotov cocktails then someone in the group started getting on the web and looking at how you make a bomb on the web. And then they got put in good contact with someone who knew how to make a serious bomb. And that's when this became a much more uh, um, uh, lethal in, um, uh, plan. So that all happened from the killing of the guards. And these are some of the things I found in there. So the police are at pain to so every turn to link FBI terrorism. And so um, this is what they're doing. And then, of course, last night, here's the arrest of Munama, being led out by Denzel's police. And this is the headlines uh, immediately. Munama Ditanka by Denzel's 88. So uh, uh, suspected of involvement in terrorism. So this linking in the public mind of terrorism and FBI. And uh, this is the most recent my meme, and they're quoting up here one of the more liberal-minded sort of uh, social media influencers, Denis Sirikar. The target's locked in, congratulating the police for arresting him. So uh, alarm, uh, on alert for jihad. Um, and the, uh, this is a sign that the, uh, the madness of the regime, or the, the extraordinary madness of the regime, the panic of the regime, um, the tyranny is, is very clear, and so it's all coming together. It's all crystallising in the minds of people. Now, of course, on social media, you'll find lots of hortatory things like this, but the fact that the Chondet group was preparing bombs when they were intercepted by the police is just an indication of, of what can potentially happen. So the price of excessive repression, further erosion, erosion of confidence in the state to uphold the law and to treat all citizens, including Islamists, fairly. It deepens the animosity between the law enforcement and militant Islamists. It accelerates Indonesia's democratic reversal because it breaches the rights of, I think, the freedom of association and freedom of expression by disbanding social organisations without course to judicial review. In most democracies, an action such as banning a large social organisation would be something that would be in the purview of a judge or a panel of judges. In Indonesia, that's not the case. This is by government fear that FBI has been abandoned. And last of all, a point, broader point I would make, the near impossibility for any, even authoritarian states, to engineer... Um, the attitudes of, it, of, a Muslim, of a faith community, in this case the Islamist community, to force people to be moderate, it will not work. The New Order regime fell, found this out. It was very quickly apparent from the early Reformasi period where all these people of Islamist views suddenly emerged again. And so that will be the case here. The last point I would say is that they have this attendant risk. Now it's the so-called pluralists who are ascendant and really attacking the Islamists. Who knows who wins the next presidential election in 2024, even 2029. 
if they are backed by Islamist forces, will it be payback time? And will you have a further escalation in this kind of uh, series of events that we've had so far? The final slide is just this one. This is an earlier social media thing that FPI is just a vehicle. It doesn't matter if the vehicle's not there. FPI is not the goal in itself. There's a much broader struggle here, and that's to bring Islam formally into national life, into people's lives. So FBI can be dissolved, Rizik thrown into jail, but the broader struggle continues. I'll leave it at that. And I'm sorry for taking so much time. Uh, wonderful presentation. So now we are in Q and A session. I'm sure that you have lots of questions in mind already. <laughs> yeah, we start from uh, the uh, from here from uh, Mahoni and. Um... Okay. Thanks very much. Uh, it seems to me that you're right that this method of dealing with jihadist uh, vision within a uh, democratic society is the, the worst method, except for all the others to characterize her place once a person should. Um, I mean, in, in a way, ever since Snooker Brandy in the last hundred years or so, it's sort of held the show together, this idea that you have to, that is, it's not just it's still the idea, the elite, you have to crack down hard on any Political expression of Islam that encourages violence or acts acts violence, uh, and it comes it's, as you say. It, there's a fluctuation. This is a moment of of, of pushback for the anti uh, the, the sort of pro, pro pluralist, if you like. And the next election might see it move. Well, it certainly will see it the other, but without some of the pushback um, and the attempt. Some of the, I suppose what I'm trying to say is that what you uh, demonized the attempt to marginalize uh, this kind of voice within the political space. There's something wrong with that. It seems to me there's something eminently right about that, and that is sort of what happened for most of the 20th century. That, that was, on the whole, a successful enterprise. Even if, you say, after 30 years of making it work, it didn't work for survival I mean, after he died, but um, after he was overthrown. But, uh, but that's, that's always going to be that. When you look at the alternatives of either sort of co-opting, riding the tiger like Erdogan and, and turning against minorities, or a military coup like Egypt, or a just disaster scenario in Pakistan of, of the military working, that the Indonesian model is still the best hope for, uh, still, or perhaps even again, you know, because the, the times we live in are tougher times than, than past times for managing global ideals of, of uh, caliphate and so forth. Uh, it, it, it's, it's looking like the best of the options of the big Islamic countries. I can't think of an alternative that works better. And, and um, therefore, I sort of wonder if, you know, when FBI starts quoting you in their trials and in their propaganda, <laughs> whether uh, you sign off beyond, I'm not sure about your side. <laughs> Uh, should we just collect two questions first part? Okay, uh, thanks to Faisal. Uh, yeah, thanks, thanks, Greg. That was that really filled in a whole lot of parts of the picture that I haven't, haven't really got my head around. Um, and, and I really like your analysis. But I suppose I'm a little bit like Tony in, in the feeling that what do you do? And there's two elements to that. I mean, one, um, just in terms of points of democratic comparison. I kept thinking of Australian law and Department of Home Affairs that, that, that actually, in, in Australia, Rizak probably would have been bundled away in secret and we might not have found out much until like, years afterwards. Um, but, uh, but kind of more, more seriously, um, obviously Rizak was upping the ante. He, he chose to come back. He decided that the, the pornography charge wasn't going to work and that he could, he could take that on. But he was really obviously taking on Jacoby. And, and what you said about 
uh, his statements of let's take on the omnibus law was a really clear statement. And so in some ways, he may have thought that he could reprise his anti-Harhawk uh, campaign in a, in a larger anti-Jokowi campaign. So in a sense, he, he, he's the one that uh, was doing the provoking and this is the reaction. What else would he have expected? Yeah, uh, well, um, so uh, <laughs> let me come back to Tony's question first. I'm not without sympathy for the argument. Uh, you know, I, I, I've done some, not a lot of research, but I've done some research at FBI and I've been to some of their events and I've certainly been down and to where um, Rizik lives and interviewed him and the like. And um, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a tough militant community. And, um, uh, and for people who've been on the receiving end of his book, Takri, uh, sorry, of um, uh, FBI, I can see why there would be relief that this is now removed at least directly as a threat to them, that you can no longer have people in uniform with the flags and the like turning up on your door, as has happened for people who've posted particular messages on social media, all of a sudden you've got a pack of goons in front of your house uh, and the police won't do anything and you're being pushed around and you're being threatened and uh, there's all sorts of stigma associated with that. So to the point that hasn't FBI only flourished and such organisations elsewhere only flourished because there are people in the armed forces or the police that are encouraging that. And if you could stop that, I mean, that was doable. Well, uh, the question would be, can you stop that easily? Uh, the police, for example, have been very... Uh, cooperative with FBI. Um, one of the things that's often said that um, if you want to get FBI to stay out of an issue, you've just got to pay them to do it. You know, I've heard accounts of senior police officers saying that. I can't independently confirm them, but uh, uh, so I can imagine for for people who who have genuine and you know strongly held pluralist views, they think Indonesia is better off without FBI. Um, and you know, Sally White and I have been doing these interviews on religious polarisation. We've been over the last few weeks and been hearing this repeatedly. But nonetheless, you still have to have the see it from the other side. Um, the discussion about, well, even the caliphate, for example. Caliphate is a basic concept within Islamic politics. There have been a great many hundreds of caliphs through the, through the centuries, as you know. Um, the government is getting near to a point where saying mention of caliph makes you ideologically suspect. Um, and that's uh, not a place where a democracy should be. Why shouldn't there be discussion about those sort of things? Um, but also the issue of um, the, the Sharia-based Indonesian state, this Enkara Ibu Sharia, there is a 50-year history of, of debating about, well, 70-year history if you want to go into it, I suppose, of that being something that people will debate about. And why now should the government say that that is problematic? You should accept the Panchasila and the 1945 Constitution as final, as almost sealed documents when it comes to the Islamic issue. What democracy actually imposes that, where you say that we can't even discuss this any longer? In a democracy, that is problematic. So to my mind, the, 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 the preferable cause, when you say if, you know, what would be less worse, what we're doing, the preferable cause would be to have clear, consistent policing on this matter. Rizik has been jailed twice, in 2003 and 2008, for breaking the law. He could have been jailed probably another 10 times for various things he's said and done. And certainly lots of his um, FBI people have been jailed. So. It's possible to take the law against them uh, and to do it in a really concerted, consistent way so that they know exactly where the boundaries are. Every time you break the law, there'll be, you know, tindak and tigas from the, from the apara and, and you'll end up before a court and probably in jail. And that's what hasn't been happening. We know during the SBY period, a lot of groups like FBI were given sucker. Um, the government didn't particularly like them, but in fact, they didn't try to restrict them very much at all. That was all part of SBY's strategy. So that's one of the reasons FBI became as big as it has become, or was um, at the time of its banning, particularly around Ahok, 
fun. There was an enabling element to that beauty on the period. Um, so that's what I would say would be a much better response to that. Of course, there'll be grey areas where the police can't act, but that's better than um, what looks like um, not manufacturing charges, but, but elaborating on charges to make them look far more serious, such as the terrorism issue, for example, making it look much more serious in the FBI's case than what it really is. It's not good. We know it can be a violent organisation, but not that violent. Um, for, um, for Adrian, this is why we shouldn't take double questions because my brain limits my memory. <laughs> you were saying, Adrian, about the... Uh, just remind me briefly. Well, just about RISAC taking on him. Oh, yes, yes, sorry, sorry, which is very good point. No, absolutely, very good point. And that's exactly his plan. So before he left Mecca, the various government officials tried to get him to agree to conditions before he returned. And one of the, the, the I think the first name of condition was that he would not engage in politics, uh, <laughs> which was very hopeful on their behalf. And he refused, he refused to do that. And I think that might have actually even increased his determination to engage in politics from the very moment he landed at Sakanahata Airport. So, uh, um, so uh, yeah, there's no doubt he wanted to take this fight up to Jokowi. He felt as if that whole 212 movement had been in a vacuum since it had been forced out of the country and, um, uh, and that it needed leadership from someone like him to galvanise people again and to put pressure back on Jokowi. Also look at it from his point of view. You know, all the pornography charges and things like that. Okay. I'm reasonably convinced that those, that social media communication between him and Firza Hussain, was that her name? Uh, seems to me like that probably happened. But how did it get into the public domain? It wasn't him who put it in the public domain. That was someone else who leaked it. Who had an interest to leak it in the public domain? Someone probably in government. So all the time it's playing with legal processes. Um, and you can imagine in his case, this has just further increased his rage about how the state manipulates evidence like this in a way which is painting him into a corner, which is trying to delegitimise him. So. Thank you, Martin and Adrian. Uh, so now we move to the participant joining via Zoom. We have 90 participants joining from Zoom. Uh, so it's Great number, and we have politicians and also scholars and researchers joining us. So um, we have, we will just uh, for this uh, section, we will just read three questions, and Badruka will read uh, those questions. Uh, the first one is from Ian Wilson. What do you think the um, the implications of this the, uh, of this repression of FBI is for some of its political allies, past and present? particularly those invited Joko Way administration as political rivals, for example, Anis Batsweta. Thanks. Uh, second one is from uh, Quinton Temby. Uh, great, thanks for your seminar. What implication do this turn of events have for the field of deregulation and CVE? That's countering violent extremism. Uh, and the third question is from David Silalahi. Yesterday, Munarman, former FBI secretary, was arrested. Seems that FBI is to be destroyed entirely. How do you think it will change politics in Indonesia? Will Anis Baswedan has a chance in 2024 election? <laughs> Knowing his alliance, FBI is destroyed. Will hardline Islamic party like uh, PKS, Partai Umat, uh, recently declared by Amin Rais, fade or even grow bigger? Uh, thank you for all those questions. So first of all to Ian uh, Wilson. Um, actually, Ian is one of the few international scholars who's spent a lot of time with FBI in recent years. So um, it would have been great if Ian was here uh, to uh, actually ask him some questions. But my sense of legal consequences of this, in a way the third and the first questions have got some overlap, so I might sort of take them together. Uh, as to how Anis or any other potential rival for Jokowi uses this, I think a lot depends on what the um, fallout from the trial and the banning is. So amongst Islamist communities, that what are we talking about? Probably around about 20% of the community who are very strongly Islamist, doctrinaire Islamists. I think they will not believe any of the charges against 
um, FBI, just as they didn't, many of them didn't believe the pornography charges against him being engaged in any kind of titillating acts with a, with a girlfriend. You know, they rejected um, those kinds of messages as well, and they would probably, their views will not change. But the important thing is people in the middle of the political spectrum. And I suspect when it comes to Anis Basweda, he's a political scientist. Um, he is very skilled at reading a survey. He used to design surveys like this, so he knows how to make that kind of material work for you. If those surveys show after, in one or two years time, that the majority of people approved of the prosecution of Rizik, they approved of the banning of FBI, and they don't have a problem with the shooting of the guards, particularly if a couple of police officers go down for that, he might well decide that it's not a good path for him to pursue, to be close to those ex-FBI leaders. He might decide that he needs to take another strategy. I think he's very malleable when it comes to those kinds of things. And the same would be true for any other serious candidate who wants to challenge Jacobi. I mean, if he has a third term in 2024, even if he's coming to the end of his second term with no third term. Whoever wants to be in the running, it's how the people respond to that. I'll just add one other thing. We have that very interesting research that uh, Diogo um, uh, Fasati, Rahmud Mutabi, and E. Warburton did uh, the experimental research, which suggested that the community was actually quite susceptible to arguments being put forward to it by political leaders whom they trusted. And so it might be that the community itself is quite malleable on these things. If there is overwhelming flow of information that FBI was a terrorist organisation, that RISC endangered the health of the community with his, his behaviour, it might be there is a turning of opinion against him and against the organisation. Um, so I think we just have to wait and see about that, um, what happens over the next year or two. Um, and how the issue settles down. So I have that. So the question about PKS and Umar that came from, I'm sorry, I've forgotten the third question was name, but um, I, PKS, I think, is, is, as we mentioned a couple of weeks ago, playing a double game here. On the one hand, it's seeking to extract benefit as being the only party that is, in quotes, Islamist in the parliament, even though they say they are post-Islamist. So they've got one agenda for the Islamist community and they have another agenda for the mainstream community which is to downplay their Islamism. And they hope the combination of those two strategies maximises their vote. It worked pretty well for them at the last election where they did pick up, it seems, a lot of that 212 movement sympathising vote. Went to PKS because there was um, not many other options. Pata Uma, let's see what happens to that. It's very early days. Um, I mean, has had a number of roles. I mean, Rice has had a number of roles on the dice. Uh, I'm not sure whether this party is going to get off the ground and be able to meet all those quite onerous requirements to register as a party at the national level, opening all those offices, all those office holders. Um, I think we have to wait on that. PKS is another matter for that, because um, they've already got the infrastructure. Uh, the second question from Quinton. Hello, Quinton. Um, uh, and that's the impact on CBE and PBE. I think this has made countering violent extremism, preventing violent extremism programs a whole lot harder, uh, particularly if they're being run by the state, because people will say, well, on the one hand, you talk about moderation, you talk about the kind of rule of law and, and fairness that democracy should entail, and then you are persecuting a particular Islamist group because they don't agree with your view of this. So is this is really democratic. Are contrary views being allowed to be expressed, being given space in this society, or are they being shut down systematically by an increasingly repressive government? They think it's the second one. It's that latter, bleaker perception. So therefore, the gap between what might be talked about in CBE or PDE <coughs> and what actually people see is actually happening around them just gets ever greater. So I think it makes it harder, not impossible, but it makes it much harder to do CBE. It's hard to do CBE and PBE anyway for a whole lot of reasons, but I think this makes it much harder because of the, the people who you really need to reach out to are the people who have a far deeper mistrust of those kinds of messages now. Thank you. Um, thank you very much.
but right now we are taking from uh, this room again. Yes, um, do you have any questions? Thank you. Uh, please. Um, just a very quick one. Um, where, uh, I suppose from the government side, where do you think it goes to from here? Where does it end for the government? Will they be satisfied now that FBE is kind of convincingly dealt with? Or is there more that they want to do? The reason why I ask that is that I know uh, within kind of the ruling government setup, within some of the agencies as well, it's probably more particularly within uh, segments of civil society who strongly back the government, which is strongly pluralist. Um, they still have an extended list of groups they would like to deal with. FB was at the top of the list. Um, the likes of Denis Senegar, Adair Magno, and people like that are also heavily critical of Salafi groups, heavily critical of the gays. Is the government going to be content where it is now? Or do you think it would push beyond it and actually start looking at other mainstream conservative groups potentially uh, to have restrictions on them as well? Yeah, I'm oh, sorry, should I answer that? Oh, this is fine. While it's in my mind. Uh, the, um, that's a really good question. I think that's a question that a lot of people are asking um, uh, about um, is there a next stage? I talked about boundaries being pushed further out. Is there is the next stage to go after uh, groups who are closer to the mainstream in FBI? Um, and I think we just have to wait and see here. The government's making some concessions to Islamic sentiment. Jokowi made some concessions to Islamic sentiment. So they could feel as if the message has been sent and has and been effective in that regard, and that the risks accumulate if you push too far. I've got no idea, I've got no insight to what's happening in the government, and we know we get to Indonesia for 15 months, so it's, it's really hard to get a fix on this. But in talking to a lot of Islamic leaders, they also are not quite sure where quite a bit of this push is coming from. Uh, what kind of forces in government, how much within PDLP and other coalition parties, how much from TNI, law enforcement, intelligence community, a lot of those things we can speculate, but a lot of those things are not absolutely clear. Um, so uh, I would have thought government, I mentioned that I think they're fairly happy with how things have gone so far. And I think they've achieved their immediate objectives. And uh, they don't have a problem on the streets from, from RISIC, for example, mobilising people. They don't have outward uh, opposition to key pieces of legislation like the Omnibus Law. Um, and they've done that as a result of a comprehensive crackdown, not just on Islamist groups, but on student groups and the like. So, uh, so I think they might feel as if they had things under control. My question would be this issue of control, um, is it for the longer term? And, and do people change their views as a result of these kinds of actions? Uh, it's hard to imagine that anyone in FBI, I know Enu are trying to invite them back, come and join Enu, you know, come back to your brothers with Enu and things like that. But, and it might be in some parts of Enu, they find, uh, they find people who are like-minded and quite conservative. But it could well be that they haven't actually changed their core views about what needs to be done. You need direct action, you need to be on the streets, you need to be militant in order to make a change. And, um, and you need to be more militant perhaps in view of these recent events. So, um, so that's why I'm very doubtful that, um, that this, will, this will expose um, just what the limits of the state are in the long term. That old analogy that um, Don Emerson used to have that in the New Order period that, that cracking down on Islamists was like hammering a nail into a piece of wood. It may not be sticking up above the, the surface of the wood, but you just hammer it deeper into the nail and it will work its way out. And these people with their views, they will express those at some point in time in the future and they will make political choices and they will make associational choices and the like. And so. We're not done with this, and the government's actions probably made that worse. Thank you, Patrick. I have a question. <laughs> so, um, regarding, I think probably it's related to the double standard that you mentioned. In 2017, uh, Sefru Mujani um, uh, had a research on, uh, on this um, uh, 
the FKE. And then uh, one of the things that the result mentioned was that the more someone likes music, the higher the tendency to support ISIS. So I was like, well, what's your view on that one? And in 2000, the other thing in 2008, just before, uh, one year before Bustur uh, passed away, he also mentioned that he encouraged government to ban uh, three, um, uh, three organizations, MMI, uh, HTE and FBI, and now we can see one by one they've already disbanded. So we'd love to hear your thoughts on that. <laughs> <laughs> Is it prescient? Yeah. Or, uh, <laughs> um, so on the survey by Safal Jani, I suppose without seeing the survey, you, you would need to know um, what other leaders were high up. I imagine any conservative or ultra-conservative leader uh, probably there's a, a high correlation between sympathy or support for ISIS and sympathy or support for leaders like Khabib Rizik. So if we're talking about um, Mohammed al Khattab, for example, or any of these other kinds of leaders, would they also have ranked highly uh, in those kinds of polls? I don't know whether they those things tell us a great deal. Those at various times, those surveys have also come up with surprisingly high support levels for JI. Um, what did that mean? How many people are answered yes for that question? Because it's written down there, Jama'a Islamia. Oh, well, Islamic congregation. Some people would know it was a bad terrorist organisation, but other people may not have. Um, and so I don't know whether these things where you're asking people and you give them a few seconds to make a decision, whether it's actually that significant, um, whether it's a particularly informed decision. And we know those sort of things bounce up and down depending on what the reporting is at any particular time. So um, uh, I would have thought it's to be expected that someone who had the kind of strongly Islamist agenda that Habib Rizik had um, would be much more attractive to someone who thought that ISIS was a good thing than, by comparison, uh, Saeed Agil for the chair in Inu or Nashir, the chair of one of the year. So, um, so I don't know whether there's much to be read into that. There, there's a whole discussion about whether believing in political Islamism or vigilante Islamism, whether that presupposes one to being eventually a terrorist. And there's debate about how we interpret the evidence on that. I don't think survey data alone is going to tell us much. Thank you, Babek. So should we, uh, we still have like three minutes. Should just read one more question from uh, the Zoom participants. Okay, uh, this one from Adrian Wan Arsani Ali. Thank you, Padre. Uh, I would like to know your view on the lack of support from other Islamic organizations, for example, uh, NU and Muhammadiyah, in Indonesia to FBI. It is almost like by doing nothing, they support the government active in banning FBI. Does it mean that FBI has been alienated by the Islamic community in Indonesia? Does it also mean that FBI's ideology does not actually reflect the main views of Muslims in Indonesia? Thank you. That's a very good question. Uh, thanks for that. Um, I think it's certainly true that, a, as I mentioned, there is a certain alienation with FBI uh, in the community, more for its methods rather than necessarily what it espouses. But um, the, the silence, so as far as I'm aware, um, Ebenu, the, the Central Board of Ebenu, has not released any statement regarding the banning of um, FBI. Individual board members have, executive members have, but not no formal statement from from Ebenu. Um, and I'm pretty sure that's the case for uh, for um, Pemimwamidia as well. Why is that? I think there is um, there's some ambivalence. There would be the more progressive elements in both of those organisations would think. Um, good riddance, we're happy to be rid of, of FBI. Um, it's a bad thing for Indonesia to have such a sectarian, disruptive, violent sort of um, group there. But I think there's probably also significant minorities, at least in both Indo and Mahmoudia, who would actually be very sympathetic to FBI <coughs> and like the kinds of things that they do, cracking down on immorality when the police refuse to do so, and you know, all these things in the laws, prostitution, illegal, gambling, why don't the police do something about it? Well, in the absence of the police, well, here are Muslims taking things into their own hands, and so 
that's not something we should be condemning or, or um, banning. So um, there is no significant elements of conservative opinion within both those organisations. So um, they also weren't consulted. I mean, this is what's different with his book, Tafri, where Emu was pushing hard and indeed badgering Jokowi to ban his book, Tafri. So then when it happened, they, of course, they were delighted and they expressed that delight. Um, from what I understand, they were given some prior warning that this was going to happen about FBI, and they decided that they should respond quietly to that. Um, so uh, I suspect that reflects the much more sensitive nature about what's going on. The FBI is a big organisation. Um, there is some concern about the basis of the case uh, against it. And, uh, and whether this is a proper path for, and particularly the Mohammedan people have been very consistent in saying that they should have due legal process. And we don't have due legal process under the purple four months, which means that the government, by with the stroke of a pen or six pens in this case, can ban an organisation and there is no independent review of the evidence against that. The organisation itself doesn't get to defend itself. The purple also set out a whole process where they'd be notified that you you're in, potentially you could be banned. I think you're given two warnings and you've got a response to that. Well, as far as I know, none of those conditions were met in the FBI case. So those kind of procedural things, um, which um, uh, which should be explored as well. Um, so um, yeah, so I hope that's an adequate answer. Thank you very much, Patrick. So, um, thank you very much again, Patrick, for uh, such a wonderful uh, talk and also for addressing such a very timely and important topic. Um, and thanks, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, there is a book launch next week online um, on dimensions of uh, COVID 19 in Indonesia. Uh, and the editors are Frank Pablo Lewis and also Fabio Firman. So please uh, don't forget to put in your, on your agenda. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.